information that needed to be done. It's like, oh, don't forget this, John. Don't forget to record. All right, we are now recording. Everybody got that message. Fantastic. Uh, welcome, Raphael. Welcome, Yu Yan. Welcome, Karen. Welcome, Angela. Welcome, Angela, as you come in. And fantastic. All right, so our topic today, our theme for this week is international and non-traditional students, 10 ways to support. If you look at the activity sheet, pasting that in chat again. Uh, jump into that. It should be an editable Google document that you can jump into and add your ideas to. Um, you will see that we have an overview and we have some takeaways and then we have these ideas called questions here. And on the left hand column, if there are questions that you have, questions that you think somebody might have, somebody, anybody, an instructor might have, um, jump into that and add it in that left column. Similarly, if you have an answer, because we depend on you as our experts in many ways, you all have experiences that I don't have, that we don't have. So please jump in there. And if somebody has a good question um, on the left hand column, jump into the right hand column and give them your tips, suggestions, resources, things you've done, your experiences that you've had, etc. And welcome, Tara. Um, so we're first going to have an overview of the theme. We're going to generate the questions. That's that point that I just talked about. And then we're going to talk about those questions. We do have a uh, link to a Microsoft Teams channel that so far has not been very active in these labs, but someday maybe they will be. Um, so if you think of things after the lab that you're like, oh, I should have shared that there, that link is the place to jump in and share it. And that way, at the very least, next time we'll be able to take that resource and put it in because it was put somewhere. And then an invitation to everybody here today to come on back tomorrow and we can dig deeper, work on things that are specifically about applying it to your situation. Um, over the past several weeks, we've had very low attendance at these. So if you ever want one on one time with John, um, it's a good time to come in and and get that. And I'm always there and I'm always happy to do as much as I can for whatever topic it is that you want to talk about. All right, so. Non traditional international students, you've probably all seen these folks in your classrooms um, and you may have noticed that they're not like the students from um, from Wisconsin, right? They're not like a lot of the students uh, that you see running around at the house parties around Madison. Um, there's a difference between them, right? Their needs are a little bit different, um, and yet I'm going to make this point. I, I spoke about it just a little bit at the beginning um, before most of you came in uh, with with Kristen and Tim that during the pandemic, we've had a lot of remote students who are at home with um, maybe not dependents, although a lot of them, of course, do. Over 70% of our student body um, fits into the non traditional um, student category, but even more so now because some of them are working home taking care of their younger siblings, right? Um, or maybe they're working at a job because their parents have been laid off um, and they're contributing to the household. So I'm wondering if that's going to change what non traditional means, or maybe it's just going to be a category that goes away as it's no longer like a segment of the population, but kind of. We have to recognize that our students are diverse and they have diverse needs, and if we start to think about them as individuals and uh, intersectionality right of identities. That it mixes and matches and it, it, it flows together and everyone's different. A lot of the tips that we've shared today in the activity sheet will work. They help your regular students, regular students, as well as your um, special category students. So keep that in mind. I suspect things are going to change. Um, I will now and throughout the um, session today ask other folks, all of you, um, feel free to raise your hand if you feel like raising your hand, jumping in, type stuff in chat um, if you'd like to. Um, if you if there's a point that you'd like to follow up on a point that I've made or come up with your own point or rebut my point. Um, please just unmute yourself and jump in and, and do so. Uh, we have a small enough group and this is not a formal, you know, chancellor led meeting. So jump in and have at us um, and, and share with us. OK. 
OK. So. Some fun stuff that I saw. UW Madison ranked as number one for the best colleges for non-traditional students, according to what is that? Um, collegefactual.com. I don't know where they are, um, but. You can bet people look at them and say, "Ooh, I want to go there. Um, they're doing an uh, UW Madison online targeting specifically uh, through the new personal finance program in the School of Human Ecology, specifically targeting non-traditional students. Um, the Badger Ready program is another one that that brings folks together. And that's just the non-traditional students. And uh, if you want to know if you're a non-traditional student, here are seven things that the uh, were decided back in the 90s, I think, of what a non-traditional student is. In addition to that, we've got international students. Um, fun fact, was it last year, two years ago now? We were ranked 24 out of like 2,000 plus schools as, hey, come to UW-Madison, we've got good support for them. Um, or it's a good school for international students. They make up about 15% of our student body, so that's a, a, a pretty high number, um, and you will run into them. Our big five takeaways, and I want to uh, give a shout out to, to Tim and Kristen and Catalina. They jumped into the activity sheet and helped me out. Um, they gave me all kinds of little uh, tips and points that we could do. I took those tips and points and I categorized, themed them, lumped them into these five groups um, that we will go over or that we've broken up farther down. So foster connection here is foster connection up there. You have ideas on how to foster connection and you have probably fostered connection with your tradition, uh, non-traditional, traditional, non-traditional and international students, right? Please share your ideas here. You can just go in, click at the end of this and do an easy uh, add E there and say, this is a really challenging thing, um, but I did it because I'm awesome and then type it in what it is, or here's an easy thing that'll help with that. Um, fostering connections, preparing the students, uh, communicating effectively, assessing them inclusively, um, and educating yourself, things that we can do to sort of forever increase um, our own lifelong learning. All right. Anybody want to jump in and share some thoughts, ideas, um, things that we should um, talk about today, um, additional suggestions, feel free to do so now. Or anytime. I also mentioned that um, I read this article, this quote came from, that talked about how Brainstorming ideas is kind of limiting because it's not sort of a. Oh, now I'm I'm totally failing. Click on that little link there under Tina Seelig and read that article. Um, basically, let's come up with questions. Um, so even if you don't have a question that you are dying to find out today, think about a question. Channel your instructors, your colleagues, your friends, uh, your international students and to form a question on the left on the left hand column here. On supporting uh, international and non-traditional students and put it in there and then we can go through on the right hand column and you can answer them or other folks can come jump in and answer them and we'll talk about those. Um, these again, we can just had add this tab bar and we will continue adding spaces as as you would like. So I'm going to give us a few minutes of uh, me being silent for you all to raise your hand, unmute, say something, or if not, just work on the um, on the activity sheet here. <clears throat> Cliff, go ahead. All right, got a question. Thank you. Now, if you guys don't know, uh, my name is Cliff Cunningham. I work in the Learn at UW team. I do not <laughs> actually. I interact with very few students. Um, I'm mostly on the staff support, uh, faculty and staff support. Um, but I have wondered, and I this is maybe as much my curiosity, but I am always just 
uh, thrilled, almost like a little child, when I think about walking across campus and just seeing people from all over the world. It's just kind of a cool thing, and you hear people in the uh, in the um, in, in in the union. You see a table of people speaking, and eat, none of them speak English as a native language. They're all speaking uh, English as best they can, and it's a cool thing to see. How often does is it good or healthy or right? for an instructor to actually like acknowledge that outright just kind of talk and, and and draw attention to people's differences versus at what point is that like not really pertinent to the topic it's not pertinent to the material that we're trying to discuss and it might be more distracting so at what point do you celebrate the difference and like really draw attention and try to extract from it and at what point is like you know what that's enough we need to get to the material <laughs> i don't know if that's a fully encompassed question or fully thought out question but that's where i if i were teaching classes full of truly international students, I, I don't know how much material I'd get to because I would be just fascinated by so much of all the other stuff. Good question. Um, and in some ways, we can expand this again to non-traditional students, right? Um, if you have, a, a say, a retiree, um, sometimes that's a very visible non-traditional student, right? Because you're like, 18 to 25 year old, 18 to 25 year old, maybe 30 year old, but still kind of 18 to 25 ish. And then there's this, this 70 year old person sort of sitting in the back row, um, feverishly taking notes, not on a computer, not with a phone, you know, what's happening? Let's talk about your experiences and, you know, what can you bring to the table? Good, sure, uh, sure. good question. Yeah. Any thoughts on, on that? How much time do we spend on, on students? and and focusing on what the students have to bring to the class that of the rest of the class can benefit from. Go ahead, Dan. Hey, John. Hi, everybody. Um, I, um, thinking about your question, Cliff, I was I was I come across this kind of a lot and I think it's, it's something people wonder about a lot is that what's the where is the distinction between valuing people's differences and languages in a positive way versus um you know the line of where that becomes seeing them differently and treating them differently othering them in a way that's not positive that's, that's maybe destructive or or makes them feel uncomfortable and i think that part of the the answer to that question is the way you put it when you said that you might get distracted from teaching them you know the content because you'd be so focused on their identity and who they are and what they bring and you know they international students i've been one you know i was an international student i was an international teacher i've been in you know non-international student and a non-international teacher and you know there's a a point at which it's really nice for someone to take an interest in your background mm -hmm. and your identity mm -hmm. and all of that yeah. and it feels weird if that's constantly ignored and also it can even be destructive if it's ignored because somebody might not be acknowledging some real issues than problems that you might have in understanding um, the context or the expectations because you're coming from an international perspective. You know, I talk, think about myself the first six months I was in Northern Ireland and, you know, I still couldn't even walk into a shop and order normal things for myself and know what I was going to get uh, because I was so unused to the accent and the context and all of that. But at the same time, if you're allowing, if you're if you're focused so much on those differences that you're not, uh, that you change your expectations of the person or you don't deliver, as you say, don't deliver the content. So you're not giving them the education that they signed up for because you're focused on who they are, not on what they, you know, what their goals are and what they need to learn. Or you're not expect, you're setting your expectations differently. So you're not expecting them to contribute in the same way as you would expect a student from, you know, Wausau to contribute, then that's a destructive because they're not, you're not valuing them as a person and giving them the education that they're looking for. You're focusing on, on differences rather than on, you know, making sure that you're fulfilling, you know, the ultimate goal, which is to, to, to give people the education that they're looking for. Um, I'm not sure I said everything I wanted to, but at least I got in some of it. Curious to hear what other people have to say. Yeah, that's good, Dan. There's a great. Um, I'm trying to find it right now, but one of the 
it was, well, ask before sharing that was on underprepared students, right? Um, I thought this was really interesting, and this is a thing that I, I had not thought about um, because I tend to, as I've done here, um, said, hey, y'all, come in and jump in and share your experiences and, and tell me what you think. Um, I think preparation is really important in, in this case. Um, we are often happy to do things, but we get very surprised and we're happier to do things if we have time to prepare to do those things in a way that um, makes sense. Um, I read a fun article and I don't remember which one of those it was at the very bottom um, that of the page here. Oh, thank you somebody for doing the uh, My Foreign Roommate. Um, in one of these, the top ones, there they talked about students in office hours and how a, an international student especially may come to your office hours with an un, with a sort of a script and they need to follow that script and go through that script because they need you they need to hear that you understand what their question is and so the advice that the article gave was give them a chance to go through the script and then give it you know explain back to them um, that you do understand it not just yes i understand it but um there's this idea in um, nursing education, especially in healthcare, of the teach back. And this is good for uh, us to do with international and non traditional students as well. Anyone from a different culture, and even from our own cultures sometimes. Um, what did I just say? And how would you explain this to, you know, a friend, uh, your family member, or whatever? Tell me what you heard me say in your own words. So it's not just repeating back, it's not just saying, do you understand? Yes, no, because we might, you know, if I'm in a, a high stakes situation and I feel a power differential, um, I might be like, yeah, I get it. I understand and I don't really, but mm -hmm. I just want to get out of that situation as soon as possible because yeah. Yeah. it's uncomfortable for me. So checking for understanding is really important. Um, I, I put in here uh, as a response. Um, also, uh, another thing that I've heard about tokenizing students, and this is this is big for inclusive education in general. Um, don't say, oh, you're from such and such country. What do you all think about whatever, whatever, whatever? Um, <laughs> because we're all individuals, right? I mean, it's <sighs> like you speaking for all of. Your 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 people um, and, and it's just that's not. Not good. I see that we have people with their hands up. Um, Dan, is your hand still up from now or before? And then you, Yen? No, it's from before. I'll figure out All how right. to put it down, John. My arm is getting. I, uh, it's good exercise. You, Yen, jump in. Thanks. Hi. Um, so I have some thoughts on uh, maybe so to sort of uh, um, answer Cliff's original question. Um, so I'm thinking not so much um, about how much to focus on this as a topic, uh, but rather when to bring it up. Um, so first I wanna caution that we might sometimes be assuming people's identities based on their appearances or their names, um, or you know the stereotypical things that we think certain people do. Like for example, not to call you out John, but <laughs> in the beginning when you said, you know, like, how, how do we know when students are from around here, from Wisconsin? They might be like at house parties or whatever, but an international student could also <laughs> attend a house party, right? Yes. So instead of focusing on the identities that we're assuming, um, you know, who they are, I would say bring it up or show your interest in a context. Like, for example, if they are engaged in some kind of activity and they want to talk about it, that is like, you know, some something they do in their culture, then it's a, it's a more appropriate for you to show interest, right? Than saying, oh, you have a different name, and you know, what do all people think from your country, for example, right? Like maybe show interest in the activity or what they're doing, you know, as a way of kind of engaging in that topic. Yeah, thank you. And thank you also for, um pointing out my um, constant errors. Catalina, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Catalina. I'm a faculty in communication arts, and 
a former international student. I came here for college and grad school and, and stuck around. So I have lots of experiences in that way. And I also tried to think a lot about uh, teaching uh, uh, communication to international students. And one of the things that uh, I try to do in my courses that I recommend is to kind of broadly frame cross-cultural competence as an explicit value to be conveyed in your course. So it's not about tokenizing students and picking up picking on them and asking for their individual experiences and so on and so forth, but just instill as a value for the course, you know, curiosity about practices and perspectives and ideas and, and values that are represented widely and invite students to share whenever they're comfortable, whenever is appropriate in the course. Um, in my experience, they, they really do and they respond really positively to this and, um, it's it's not just a, an additional opportunity to broaden your perspectives and to learn for learning's sake, but also it's kind of incredibly cool and unique to be able to come to a university where 15% of your peers come from all over the world and prepare you for kind of a global experience in a way that many other universities and many other countries do not. So for me, that's always been a huge draw and a huge appeal that I try to emphasize that anybody can benefit and does benefit from. And I, I flashed on screen there, the Wisconsin experience, really, really great set of four principles um, for all of those non-content related skills that we want our colleagues and fellow citizens, um, people of the world, people that we interact with to have. Um, Empathy and humility, right? Relentless curiosity, like what, what do you think about this? What are your views on this? Um, intellectual confidence, that confidence to be able to say, I might not have the right answers, but I'm willing to ask you those questions that, that are uncomfortable sometimes and to lean in at times. And then uh, purposeful action being, of course, I'd like to make the world a better place in the ways that match up with my skills um, and I identities as well. Tara, go ahead. Yeah, I appreciate um, all of the comments everyone has brought to the table thus far. And um, so being both an international student in China and in Germany um, and having gone to school here, I'm reflecting on um, faculty who have practiced assignments with multiple um, deliveries. And so I think of Tim Allen, I think of Bob March, I think of Gretchen Schoff, all in the Integrated Liberal Studies programs, who are very cognizant of providing options for students from wherever they come from. Um, and at whatever form of non-traditional um, status they held, and in any one given assignment, there might have been five different options to deliver a product um, for a grade. And so I think in, in not just honoring the values and the, the perspectives, but then how do we operationalize? So I, I've been thinking about how, how those, those faculty from UW-Madison operationalized and made accessible um, ways to honor um, non-traditional students, whether they be international or not. And so just I'm kind of putting that out there in a way of um, not just in the speak, but how do we structure our, our, our assignments and exams and projects and everything else. So I'm just, I'll stop there um, to kind of ground it. Thank you. Yeah, really good points. Um, whenever possible, provide multiple Universal Design for Learning calls it multiple means of action and expression in this case, right? And if you think about this again, this is not just a cultural thing, this is an individual thing, right? We all bring to the table in our learning a different set of experiences, a different set of values, of skill sets, right, uh, that we have in there. Our dreams are all a little bit different from, e from each other's, right? If we can harness that in our students and say, Take what you're already good at, take what you already value, take what you already know, and figure, add our content to that, then what we're doing is we're personalizing the learning. We're not doing it, the students are doing it, but we're giving them an opportunity to personalize the learning and to add it into those patterns and uh, schemas that they are already 
They've already started to organize their lives around and you're just saying, I'm not going to make you do this my way. You do this your way and then show me how it show demonstrates your mastery or your understanding of it. Um, and again, this seems like an impossible task for, for an instructor, right? Because the instructor might say, oh my gosh, I've got 500 students. How am I going to give 500 different assignments and custom customize each assignment for each of my students? I've got to learn about all the students. I've got to figure out what their dreams are. I've got to figure out like what is rubric going to look like for each of the students? Can't do that, right? Not possible, not even for five people. But if we say, here are the general things I want you to have that I want to see, and you put that in your rubric, and then we say, I don't care how you do it, just demonstrate that these are the things that are happening, then they could do it in, you know, it's up to them to do it in a paper, in a video, in a, um, I always go to the, the really easy things, the paper, the video, the uh, interpretive dance, but it could be all kinds of things that I haven't even thought of yet. Um, and again, this isn't just for non-traditional um, and international students, but for all of our students as, as well. Um, one more thing on non-traditional students and that, a lot of our non-traditional students will come back to school because they have a better sense for themselves of what they want to get out of it. So they will take your content and they will say, this will help me in my life, which is already you know, on its way in these ways. Give them the chance to do that rather than say, totally reinvent yourself, take all of your experiences, I'll throw them out the door, they're useless in my class. Bring them in, call them in, have them apply new content to their existing schemas. Um, and that's all that's all about. So thank you, Tara, for bringing that up. I've got next week's activity sheet that I'm already working on. All right, any other thoughts or questions as we get going or should we start going through this? Let's start going through this. We got half an hour left. All right, if an international student requests time extension, um, Dan's got an instinct to look at the objectives of the assessment. Um, thank you, Dan, for putting that. Timed, there's all kinds of research on timed, timed tests um, and their efficacy and the equity of time tests. Um, and there's all kinds of problems with that. However, big however, if what you are trying to teach is something that must be done um, in a short amount of time absolutely appropriate to have a time to test, right? So I like that he says, look at the objectives of the assessment. Um, and if they need the time constraint, then that's, yeah, then, then we'll go for that. Thank you. I see some more hands up as well. Angela, sorry, I, I, did, I didn't see you immediately, but I see you now. <laughs> that's and okay. No, no problem. Um, yeah, I, I was just going to chime in and kind of agree with what Dan put there. I do think, you know, if the goal of the exam is to assess knowledge and access and assess learning and, you know, meet some learning objectives, then more time isn't necessarily bad time. And I, I'm with you, too. I more and more I'm just like, why do we do time tests at all? Like as an adult, very rarely are we under time constraints that aren't sort of self-inflicted because we put something off till the last time. So finding ways to support that, like taking your time and coming up with the answer is OK. Um, it's great. But then, yeah, to your other point and Dan's point, like if it is there are, I know, in some like medical curricula where that the testing is super timed because that's going to be necessary for the board exam. And so I know they start with like two minutes per question and then they get down to like I don't know, 30 seconds or something crazy because the boards are designed that way. So part of that is the knowledge, but it's also you have to train for this test. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm thinking no time test would be super great <laughs> in general, but recognizing sometimes that's necessary. The idea of authentic assessment is really, um, uh, I think one that we do, speaking broadly as higher education in general, a terrible job of authentic assessments. Um, there are very few professions, I think, disciplines where you have to do the work yourself. Um, if I have a problem or a question that I don't know the answer to, I ask my colleagues. Um, that doesn't mean that I don't necessarily, you know, know the stuff. Um, I might, but I can learn if I can give a better answer than the answer that I have um, by discussing that. That 
that the learning that happens from me having a conversation with a colleague about this is so much better than the learning that happens if I spit out my incomplete or incorrect um, idea on a, on an exam. So if the goal of assessment is to learn and improve and get better and propel the discipline forward, then for goodness sake, let me ask my colleagues and, and such about that. Um, if it's just to tell me that I don't belong and that I'm a failure and I'm stupid, then yeah, make me put down my stupid answer and I will. I'll do my best, but it's not going to feel very welcoming. Jerome, thank you for waiting. Please jump in. Yes, hi, thanks. Thanks and, and hello to everyone. Um, I, I just wanted to chime in because I think that time is not the only thing that should be considered uh, with this question. Uh, recently had a conversation with one of our grad students in anthropology who was pointing out that uh, some of my colleagues used oral exams for as part of the qualifying exams and there was an oral component. Uh, we have a number of international students in the program and our international students felt disadvantaged by uh, the emphasis on oral communication uh, during an examination. Uh, so thinking about the modality uh, and not just the time, but also that, you know, uh, is, is something like an oral exam absolutely necessary? I don't, I, I need to have this conversation with my colleagues, but it doesn't seem to me like it is. Um, so thinking about the modality, in addition to how long an exam should take or how long a, a student should have to answer a question is, is in my mind also important. Yeah, and does it have to be a high stakes exam within a single period, you know, a synchronous period of time, or can it be a series of very low stakes things that cumulatively do two things? They build on each other, and we have a, a thing in the activity sheet about um, scaffolding and having tasks build on uh, previous tasks. So I do something, I learn how to do that, and then I use that thing to do the next thing, which I then learn how to do, and then I use that prior knowledge to do the next thing. Um, each of those can be like a five point quiz, and there are you know 100 of them in a semester. Um, easy, simple to grade. If I wake up with a headache or COVID or my drool wasn't pooled, so I'm not allowed into the classroom, um, then I'm not going to lose out on, oh, that was the day of the 30% exam. You know, and my career is ruined or I have to take another semester of or another year of school. Um, so yeah, what what are the ways that we can make this a little bit less stressful? Again, not just for international or non-traditional students, but for all of our students. All right, I'm looking around for any other hands. I don't see any. Um, so let's move on to the next one. Oh, and we've got no answers on this one already, so good. Um, this is really more of a consideration. Yeah, this is a good. Uh, what platforms are accessible for your students to your students? Um, we often make assumptions that oh, YouTube is everywhere. Google is everywhere. Not necessarily the case. Uh, Blackboard Collaborate apparently is not easily accessible in in China. Um, Facebook now isn't in Australia, right? What are these? Uh, so what do we do about that? How are we expected to use technology to teach well when our students have different levels of access to the technologies that we are using? Any good answers? Samantha, I look to you. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Um, so I, I put in this consideration uh, because this is what we um, heard uh, a lot of from our students when we did a, an end of fall semester survey uh, to international students. Sorry, I should have introduced myself. I'm not an instructor or faculty member. I uh, work in international student services. Um, You're welcome here anyway. Thank you. Thank you. I love the teaching labs, um, and so I'm really glad to, to be here with you today. Um, so I, I just wanted to make the, to put this out here. And one thing that that we've been doing and focusing on a lot um, at ISS is we created a Kaltura channel so that we are not relying on YouTube um, since so many of our students, um, you know, are, are populate our largest um, 
sending country, as we call it, is China, um, and many of our students are out are currently in China. So YouTube has presented a huge issue. Um, so we are actually looking more at the tools that we have here locally at UW Madison um, that are accessible to our students. So um, I just wanted to put this one out here. Um, the Blackboard Collaborate, I don't students have just reported that they have tremendous issues accessing it i i don't believe it's blocked necessarily um so i i don't understand all of the issues uh with that one um but there have also been uh many comments that um the vpn even the uw madison vpn is not um not good enough for them uh, to use outside the US. Um, and any personal VPNs are extremely expensive. Um, so um, if you saw the last Badger Herald article, our international students already feel like they are quote unquote cash cows. Uh, so requiring them to spend um, extra money um, or resources on a more expensive VPN for them to access um, an education that they're already spending more money than their peers on would probably not go over well with our international student population. It's a really good point. Um, and Again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna broaden this um, to and point us back to universal design for learning. Um, originally for folks with disabilities, maybe uh, they couldn't see a video or they couldn't hear a video. So multiple means, multiple modalities. In some ways, technology is that double-edged sword, right? On the one hand, we're able to broadcast something, you know, around the world um, in ways not that are that are beyond the uh, what was it called? The mail order uh, UW extension. What was it called when you used to take courses by mail and they would send you this typewritten worksheet and you'd fill it out and then you'd send it back in the mail. Remember those days, do you all remember those days? Was Correspondence, correspondence courses, courses, right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you Tara. Yeah, so technology has made the correspondence course way better in a lot of ways, but it's not optimal yet. There's still blocking of YouTube in some countries and Facebook in other countries. Um, and some things are more expensive than that price of a piece of stamp, but feedback is faster, right? So what are the pros and cons? Again, if there are ways to cover our basis um, by having at least two options, so Kaltura and YouTube maybe, or you know, so YouTube for the convenience of folks who can use it and Kaltura for the um, access, perhaps some inconvenience, but access for the people who, who can't um, access YouTube. Um, and means. John, may oh, I just add, yes, yeah, and, and just to reinforce what you're saying, um, I mean, I, I'm, I tried to, I don't, I don't know, universal design, yes, but I'm always like as the simplest possible path to deliver, so I'm, I'm delivering employee um, compliance training through multiple languages at third grade reading level within with you know the most extreme cases um, of complex research topics right and so bottom line though for delivery is yes i'm always sticking with culture and we help drive the need for the streaming server for those purposes uh, like campus um, licensed and then for like we're dealing with federal um, so what we call affiliates, so people who are not UW Madison or they might be UW Health employees as well, um, or extension before extension was part of us that um, staying away from YouTube, staying away from the private and literally trying to find like literally just going with a, a public website. Um, and sometimes, you know, it depends on the content like animal research. We can't we can't go there to release any footage, for example. But to boil down the delivery um, platforms to the simplest possible, um, and I, I don't know what else to add there other than, and sometimes our own internal departments block, right? And so like yep. for some time we had issues with the School of Business not being able to view um, YouTube channels or other things. So it's just... I don't know. I'm just I'm going the, the kiss principle, which maybe you address in some other way. But 
so and it's like the thumbs up for like culture is important and <laughs> or some yeah. continuing streaming server and how do we promote um the continued use of rather than sort of what's easy from a private sector perspective or general user perspective um in the instructional environment yeah there's a good balance between keeping it as simple as possible and there is no one solution that fits everybody so how do you find that balance of what two or three things? And remember, even if it's just one other option, it is still multiple means of expression or modality and we will be able to catch um, and help out the folks who can't do the one uh, thing. Jerome, your hands up. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I hear your your you know strong advocacy for having uh, you know Kaltura and YouTube. I do want to put a, a, a plug in for Kaltura uh, over YouTube and, and thinking about accessibility. Um, when we work with Cultura and with the McBurney uh, Center, it is possible to have videos with uh, good quality closed captioning and for that closed captioning to be stable. So once the video is uploaded to Cultura and it has been closed captioned, it could be reused and reviewed whenever is necessary. That is something that YouTube, of course, cannot guarantee things go away. You may find the same video again with a slightly different address posted by somebody else, but the captioning is shit. So uh, some of your students will lose access that way. Kaltura provides a, a tremendous, working with McBurney, a tremendous service there uh, in terms of accessibility. And one of the things we're doing with labs is um, this recording that we're doing here um, is being uh, captions generated. Um, I'll look through them. I can upload them to YouTube with the video itself so that it does use those checked captions. Um, couldn't do this a, a year ago. It's kind I'd of like know. this. This is a this is an amazing sort of uh, technology keeps on. Hopefully meeting our needs better and better. Um, so what was possible? What was not possible at one point? You know, maybe the problems will all be solved by next week when something new comes along. But yep. I'm glad to know that my my swearing will be uh, captured in writing now. Yes, yes, and I'll <laughs> make it even worse because I can go in and change it to a much more inflammatory. Uh, <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> all right. We did talk a little bit about this one already, so I'm going to skip it out in the uh, 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 for, for time unless somebody else has some new ideas there. I like the uh, don't assume people's identities, and this goes back to the idea of ask them, ask what their um, culture is. Um, individually, not on the spot again. Um, all right, how can we ensure that students' languages um, are valued and not actively devalued in their work and studies at UW? We have a, a syllabus statement regarding language and following up with actions. I want to find out what this link is. Linguistic bias, fantastic. I think I did. Um, is that shared down below? I think it is in the uh, activity sheet. We have a thing on. Yeah, yeah, you shared oh. that and I, I put that in there, um, John. So yeah, this is Kristen. Um, yeah, so. You know, I think bringing attention to your class about linguistic bias and what it is um, would be a great way and, and something specific regarding this question is to actually have a statement on your syllabus about this um, and, and to explain, you know, like what active listening is um, and or maybe more sympathetic listening too. like if someone someone is speaking with a non standard accent, um, how how you can get students to stop saying what, what, what all the time and instead trying to, to listen better. Um, and that I'm, this is, you know, much like Dan, I've, I've been an international student, um, an international employee, a non-international student and a non-international employee, and I'm married to someone who speaks with a non-standard <laughs> accent as well. Sorry, Tim, I couldn't, I couldn't help it. Um, so I'm really, I'm speaking that from, from personal experience too. Very good, uh, thank you. Cliff, go ahead, I see you, your hand up as well. And then JC. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, the, the phrase linguistic bias, could someone elaborate on that or explain that, define it? Sure, I, I can, I can, uh, uh, 
attempt to do that. Um, yeah, well, just just like you know, racial bias. Um, it's your bias about what you're listening to, you know, about what you what your views of language are. So, for example, you know, we we have there's a standard accent that many of us think is standard. Um, and if you hear accents that are different than that, you will we all will have biases that come up um, and that will cause blockages and cause us to, to do things um, just like other biases, right? So I just, you know, implicit bias is real and it's not just racial bias. There's also something called linguistic bias. So um, this can be, this can come from different varieties. So for example, um, if, if you're looking at like uh, learning, a student learning Spanish, you know, um, maybe prioritizing varieties of Spanish, some varieties of Spanish over other priorities of varieties of Spanish. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. There's a fantastic article about a uh, blog about this from the Writing Center, which is linked towards the bottom. And, um, you know, linguistic bias can come across in writing too. It's not just what we hear. Um, and again, it's like, what's what are what's standard academic writing? Like who, who who are we to who are the gatekeepers and all that so it's, it's kind of questioning all this it yeah thank you and like uh, the thing that 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 i often have heard and and helps me figure this out is oftentimes in the midwest we think of the midwest standard right and we hear things like uh, radio broadcasters will train in chicago so that they can get that standard american dialect um and accent and oftentimes people will say, oh, you talk funny because you talk from south, down south. You know, that kind of bias shows up um, rather than say, oh, that's kind of an interesting way of saying that. Um, or listening carefully to say, did I hear this right? Um, it's it, it adds that level of judgment and bias uh, against it. Um, the different ways of saying things and I will say in, you know, this uh, in some ways applies or can be extended to jargon within your, our specialties, right? We will often as professionals educated with our, you know, high degrees, um, we will feel the need to um, speak very eloquently and in um, coded language that only other people who have studied the same authors that we have studied um, can interpret and decode. And that's, that's awful and intimidating if you're not part of the club. It's that inside joke, um, except it's not funny, except, you know, if you're feeling really snobby about it. Um, so what can we do is to simplify, to reach more people, to say things in multiple ways? Um, I, I really like uh, that idea. One of the thoughts came up, um, was it at the very top? No, it was uh, in, in one of the questions. Uh, I put this down as challenging. Dun 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 dun. Assess inclusively, accept non-English resources. Do you allow um, for research your students to use sources that aren't in English? That's that's tough, right? As a person who doesn't know a lot of other languages, how can I, as an instructor, assess? these sources if I can't read them myself? I don't know the answer to that. Um, and maybe, you know, I don't know if somebody else wants to jump into that, but I feel like that's related to the question uh, that we're addressing with linguistic um, biases. Um, JC, I want to see you there, but I also see Dan jumped in. Um, so whoever, both you guys both uh, unmute and start talking at the same time, please. Or whoever feels um, that they wanted to talk about this point, maybe. OK, I'm just going to jump in with a couple ideas. Yes, sorry, Dan. Thank you. <laughs> um, OK, so just really quickly, a couple things that come to mind. I teach workplace English, which is English for uh, employees at UW, like custodians and dining folks and such. Um, and one of the things that comes to mind um, is I have four things in mind. One is the teach back thing that you mentioned, John is something that we have trained the supervisors that work with these employees. Um, and there is there does seem to be a, a clear like, oh, that makes sense. But be really careful because it can seem condescending. So 
there needs to be a mutual understanding that the purpose for doing it is to help everyone and be successful. It's an and awesome I think we can model tool. that. Right? Yeah, like totally. if we model it ourselves, like this is what I'm hearing you say totally. in my own words, then it won't come off as condescending, but just sort of a let's be on the same page. Totally. And I would imagine that could even be a mini lesson in class. Like, hey, I encourage everybody to do this. This is a good listening skill. It's good communication. Let's yeah. all try to practice this. Yeah. And then um, secondly, as far as language bias, um, one of the things that came to mind that might be worth some looking into is there's a concept called world Englishes. And if you can kind of like navigate that with the rest of your class to make sure that we remember that American English isn't the English um, and that everybody should be aware of that. Um, I'm not sure exactly how you do that in a content based class, but it seems worth exploring for people thinking about that bias element. And then two things that I think people could do for engaging with cultural competency. Um, I think we need to call people out gently um, to fix some things that might happen sometimes when we're talking in discussions. So one way would be if you hear people saying all people in, uh, you know, Wisconsin or all people. So gently say, you mean some people or you mean a few people and like, and then just move on, you know, but I would say like interrupt and fix that when you hear it. Um, and I would also say, that asking why do you think that would be useful as well. And I think these might be more tools for the white folks in the class, um, but I think that some of that could be useful for any number of multicultural elements, not just international. So those are all the things that came to my mind and I wanted to share. Thank you very much for sharing. And I learned something, I learned what World English is, is now, or I started to. Dan, go ahead. Dan Pell, your hand yeah, is still thank up. You. Um, I um, want to come back to um, what you were saying about citations and do we allow citations in um, other languages? And I think that I was at, so in in my you know academic background and in, in my work background here at UW, I spent years teaching uh, academic writing courses in which no, I didn't allow um, citations in other languages, and I deeply regret that and really challenge myself on that now because I realize how much that was around um, bias on my part. And, you know, citation is a currency in academia and it's what, who is cited is who is valued. And if we restrict ourselves to only citing authors in certain universities or with certain reputations, with certain names um, or writing in certain languages, then we are closing that door to other academics and forcing them to come in through our door. And it's as bad as, as if we were to say, I'm only going to cite someone from Oxford or someone from Cambridge going back. It's not just bias. It's, I think it's colonial. And um, it's not, when I look at that question, yes, but I don't speak X language. Well, how hard is it in an international university like ours to go to someone who does and say, hey, does this look like a legitimate source to you? And they say, yep, okay. Um, or to feed enough of it into something like Google Translate that we can get a sense of what it's about. Now, obviously, if they're basing a huge argument on something that you can't understand, then you need to get enter into a negotiation with that person to find out why they're doing that, what they're saying, and get them to justify it and explain it. But then if they're doing a citation properly, they should be paraphrasing and summarizing and explaining it. So again, it's, yep. it's um, in, in, you know, I look back on my own teaching and how many times that I might have closed the door on somebody citing someone that was of you know doing work of great quality, but I wasn't willing to 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 read that or to see that or to allow that. And I, I think it's really important that we actively, you know, remove that colonial bias of English kind of English first, basically, in academic citations and open ourselves up that there are, there's great research being done a, by people a matter of in all languages. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Jerome. And I will also say, folks, it's two o'clock. If you need to leave, mm -hmm. please go ahead and leave. Um, I'm going to stick around and keep talking. Um, so you're welcome to do that as well. Jerome, you had your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, just just first of all to to say a, a huge thank you to Dan for for his comment uh, as someone who 
often sites in multiple languages. I, I, I would find it kind of weird to not accept that from, from my own students. I also want to offer sort of a humble reality check here. Uh, I never have time to check all of the, the sources that my students use. Uh, and whether they are in English or in another language. And if they do use, as Dan was pointing out, if they do, do use their citations judiciously, and uh, I could see that they engage with the text, I could see that the text seems to be re well represented, I could see that the citations that I am familiar with are well chosen, uh, I'm willing to accept that those that I will not understand will be equally well chosen and that the students will have paid as much attention to those um, as they did to the ones in English. So I really don't see a reason why not to accept citations in a language that you, you do not understand. There's a broader need for us to broaden the network of who we cite in any discipline. Uh, I know in the humanities and social sciences, uh, you know, it seems like most of the books cited are either from Chicago or Duke uh, and <laughs> other presses seem to be ignored. Uh, so including international voices into our conversations, scholarly conversations is tremendously important. Thank you. Um, it, we are out of time. I am happy again to, to stick around and talk about fostering connections um, in courses. Um, I want to thank you all for your participation today and your help in filling out this column and this column. Um, good questions elicit good answers, so I really appreciate um, everybody's participation today. And um, feel free to go. I often am not sure what to do at this point because I can keep on just talking and um, engaging with people that are there, but there's often this sort of sense that if I do so, I'm forcing people to stick around because they don't want to be impolite and leave. So please leave if you have to leave. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to keep on talking. <laughs> That's hilarious. All right. Let's see uh, if anyone's left. Uh, do we help students learn to advocate for themselves? Who all is left here? Dan and Heidi and JC. Lane is here. And Lane, welcome. And uh, you, Yan. Oh, learning to advocate for themselves. This is uh, this came up as well, and I think it was a. Uh, I was going to put it down as a second thing on the bottom, but instead of what I put it down, sorry for the moving back and forth. I was going to put this top paragraph as challenge students gently. Um, whether you're a non-traditional student or a an international student or a traditional student, we have expectations of what we think our teachers want. Um, and it's based on our past experiences or based on the stories of, you know, if we don't have the past experiences of higher education, it's based on stories that other people tell us. So if I come into a classroom and it doesn't match my expectations, it's going to be a stressful situation for me. And I'm going to have to decode and figure out what's happening in addition to learning the content. As we do that, be gentle uh, with me and be open and be transparent. Things like be available, check assumptions, check in, uh, have the students talk amongst themselves so they can figure this out uh, on their own. Give them prep time. Instead of making this its own thing, I was like, this is actually all of the things, right? Um, give them a heads up if you're going to share their content and ask them again. Um, clarify expectations, share models, give them examples of what other people have done so that they can say, oh, that's what they're looking for. Um, these are all sort of ways to do that. And eventually, they will figure out what our expectations are um, and they will understand that we do support them and we do respect them and we do want their opinion and then they will start to advocate for themselves and for their uh, classmates and colleagues, I think. And I see some good exam uh, good answers here as well. Um, good news about Name Coach, it is coming. It is not here yet, um, but 
keep on checking the kb.wisc.edu for it. And um, it, we should probably have an announcement, probably actually on the Learn at UW page um, is where that announcement might come. All right, what would I say to a, that's tricky. Um, colleague conversations need to happen and we need to do them and have these sometimes uncomfortable colleague conversations um, that are uncomfortable for ourselves and for them. Um, and we need to lean in. Uh, we need to have that relentless curiosity and uh, purposeful action, intellectual confidence to do that. Um, but yeah, it's a thing that I'm also always struggling with. How do I have conversations with people who hold uh, opinions that are different than mine? Um, and find that common ground, I guess. Other people have thoughts? All right. Thank you all again for coming, and I hope this was useful. If you want to keep on talking, come back tomorrow from 1 to 2 p.m. Um, if you want to just have a chat with me, uh, I invite you to unmute and uh, share your screen and jump in and say hi. Thank you, Yen. Lane, are you there? Hey, John. Yeah, I'm there. How are you I'm, doing? I'm, I'm doing well. Yeah. Doing well, well, it was fun. So it was, thanks for asking me to come. So I'm just trying to pull out the email that you sent me yesterday, uh, a couple days ago. Yeah. John, I enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Good to see you again. Thank you for jumping in, Dan, and sharing that experience. Yeah. Good. Good modeling of, uh, of of being brave and leaning in and <laughs> oh dear oh dear <laughs> yeah you know I didn't go as far as I could on that topic you know that the, like the number of things that were policy where I was.